Hello and welcome. I'm your host, author Ryan M. Oliver, and this is the Mighty Books Podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Mighty Books Podcast. Today with me, I have Mary Jaffe. So Mary dreamed of becoming a National Geographic journalist, but it was a dream unrealized. She has turned to writing historical fiction at 78 after her 35-year career in teaching, professional opera singing, which we'll get into, raising a family and caring for her terminally ill husband. Mary, how are you doing today? Great. Awesome. Good to have you on. Good to have you on. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So we're, it's kind of interesting how we got connected. You were you were selling books at the local Fred Meyer in Bremerton, Washington. Oh, was it Bremerton? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My my aunt was walking by, saw that you were selling books, and she was kind enough to chat with you. And then she mentioned that I do things about books, <laughs> a show about right. books, and got your contact information, and that's how we connected, which I think was really cool. So yeah. Yeah. So where do you where are you living around in Kitsap County? Are you in Bremerton? No, I'm in Port Orchard. Okay. Okay. Nice. Good stuff. Good <laughs> stuff. So we're pretty close to it. It's about a 20 minute drive. Right. Anyone here is listening who does not understand Kitsap County very well, but it's all pretty, pretty close together. Anyway, I want to do a little, little caveat. So we're, today we're here to talk about your books, your author career, and a couple other things. What's the title of the book, the book we're talking about today? Mary Quigley's Daw. And what Daw is, is Irish for father? Oh, okay, okay. What is and what is this about? This is a story that came out of my childhood, went from my infancy on, when my father's family, when we would get together for Christmas, Thanksgiving, Easter, whatever birthday parties, uh, with the blueberry pie or the apple pie, came a serving of grief uh, from my father that his mother had become an orphan when she was only nine years old. And he didn't know any details. His siblings, my aunts in particular, who were sitting at the table and uh, would tell a story about how she lost five siblings and both of her parents. Oh and God. she was on the Kansas-Missouri border during the Civil War. And people who, you know, who know the Civil War history know that the border was literally burnt down by order 11 because they couldn't stop the fighting on the border and it was just sucking all of the resources up and so the generals one of them was Schofield who was my mother's first cousin he's a first cousin three times removed who was sent by Abraham Lincoln to the Kansas Missouri border to settle the disputes it was his bright idea and he said to Lincoln well we're not going to stop the fighting. It's about 50-50 here. And people are fighting within their own families. They're stealing each other's cattle. They're killing each other. They're um, going into each other's houses and taking out the furniture and killing people. And oh, dang. He said, the only way we're going to solve this is just burn the darn, burn the darn place down. <laughs> so that's what they did. So when I was a little kid and I heard that my grandmother was nine years old, and that she had a four-month-old baby sibling with her when this happened. I envisioned a little girl standing in ashes holding a four-month-old baby. Mm -hmm. No houses, no food, no fence posts, nothing. And it just really was disturbing. And I later learned in my life, after years and years and years and years and years of investigation, that... Yeah. We had cousins we didn't even know who had also heard this story. So when I was nine years old, I said to myself, in a state of grief, I'm going to find that baby's sister because my grandmother cried every night of her life and prayed because she didn't want to die before she found out what happened to her baby sister. Because somehow or another, you know how it is with large families or lots of kids. Yeah. And lots of work to do that the older children are tasked with helping the mother care for the younger children. Yeah. So I always felt that my grandmother, Mary, was somehow responsible for that baby. And so I told my mother, I'm going to find out what happened to the baby if it's the last thing I do. And in fact, 
in the meantime, from the age of nine on and all the cousins looking, I found the baby sister buried in a grave a mile and a half south of Independence, Missouri. The family disintegrated in 1877. I was nine in 1952 when I decided. So the family had already been torn apart, you know, 60 years by the time I got to the story. Right. And then uh, I found the baby in 2012, oh, okay. which is when I was 67. Mm-hmm. So that's how the story came about. It's oh, just. Wow. So I decided to write the book for my family once I had all the pieces put together, but it actually took my entire life. Holy cow. So research, quite extensive research and over a long period of time. Do you see all those books behind me? Yeah, I do. <laughs> I never saw a history book I didn't like if it had something to do with the name Quigley, Civil War, you know. And I, my father reminded me that a first cousin on his side was Ulysses Grant. So it wasn't that I was lacking resources. And my maiden name is Scott. And oh, in that Scott family, Thomas Scott was president of the Pennsylvania Railroad. Oh, and wow. I am genetically related to him. And so he was sent by Abraham Lincoln to the border or it, to, to build the railroad into the South. And so I had all this incredibly rich background of family that I discovered as I got older, and it sort of compelled me forward with incredible stories and interesting stories about many individuals, you know, from the Revolutionary War on. Yeah. So I couldn't help but write the book. No kidding. Well, yeah, at that point, it kind of writes itself because it's not just a story of your family. It's kind of your story, too, after you've done it for looked around for so long. It became my life, really. Uh, It propelled me into a direction of being extremely curious and having tenacity. I had a lot of herd tenacity in my Scots Irish genes anyway. Yeah. And I had a lot of soldiers in my background. There were five Civil War generals from my family on both sides. Uh, I'm related to a couple of presidents and the list goes on. Wow. So Scotch Irish, I'm Scotch Irish also. That's pretty cool. Right. Yeah. yeah the name Oliver is pretty. Yeah, well, it's the last name. Yeah. Oliver's last name. Uh, that's the English version, but you've got the Scotch Irish comes from my, my mother's side, actually my father's side too, but I know less about his side. Uh, my mother's side got McDonald. So the clan Donald oh, is vast. Yeah, it's it, huge. It's yeah. Huge. I have Donald's in my family. Oh, yeah. So we're probably, you know, fourth cousins, cousins yeah. removed or something like I that. I ran into a guy with that new software on his iPhone and he went to the Church of Latter day Saints. They have a, with their family website, a thing where you, they put their name, you put your name, he pushes a button and he said, Oh, we're seventh cousins. Oh, funny. Yeah, I mean, we're and, oh, and oh. then he pushes another, gets another window, and it tells me how. Yeah, not it's crazy. Amazing. Yeah, Absolutely. we're all related. Oh yeah, we totally are. I mean, we totally are. When you go down to it, there's only so many bloodlines that existed at one or, point in time. To yeah, or any or, point, in time, actually. Well, apparently, way back, way back when we got to the point where the human race almost became non-existent after a long, you know, I think it was. I can't remember what that was called. Basically, it was an Anthropocene before we all uh, died. We came back, right? We came back with like right. 200,000 people left in the world, something like that, 100,000 people. Well, right. now that was how many thousands of years ago, right. and now we're 2023. Right. So you got to think, somebody somewhere has, we are all related to somebody. Yeah. I can, I can, I'm almost certain of that. I'm certain of that. After putting 37,000 people on my family tree. Oh my gosh. I know, 37,000. And that I went back as far as I could go, which was King Henry in the 1200s. And I mean, once you get there, you, there's no point looking no. anymore. I mean, it's just lots of people. And then um, on my father's side, a first cousin was Charlemagne. And I was Whoa. a descendant of the Northern King of the Holy Roman Empire, which of course was not holy. And it was also not Roman. It was more German than anything else and yeah. you know but anyway uh but then i went forward from the scots from my sixth great grandfather forward and actually found 500 descendants who either were doctors or they were politicians or abolitionists uh they had homes in the underground railroad 
uh, my fifth great grandfather, John Scott, owned the property where Princeton University started, and that was the Scots Irish, and it was just post the Age of Enlightenment in the 1700s, around 1727, and a few years further, I can't remember the exact date, right. but it was called Lawn College because the Scots Irish needed to have a university so that they could train their ministers mm -hmm. because it was required of Presbyterians, they were all Covenanters who'd gotten kicked out of my sixth great grandfather was a Scottish parliamentarian who got kicked out by King James to Ireland. And then he came here from Ireland when, when the Scots were able to convince William Penn to allow them to live in Pennsylvania because they were also experiencing uh, religious persecution. Holy cow. So when you're going through your research, like I know from, from my background, the Scotch Irish, side mm -hmm. especially the mcdonald side is vast so how do you how do you comb through all the research to find that the, the ones that actually stick out the one the legitimate ones the ones that relate to your it actually are from my family well <clears throat> believe it or not my family is full of storytellers and that's kind of an irish thing anyway and a scots irish thing as you know you yeah. sit there and tell stories all day. Yeah. Find out new stories. Yeah. Uh, one thing I love about my meeting people when I sell in the Kroger stores is that you just meet so many interesting people. And there, every person has a million stories that they don't even know about unless they're, you know, interested. But really, family legend really turned out a lot of it to be true. And then I, after DNA came about, then you could go back through these trees right. and get get them organized. And of course, people used to name their families in specific, very specific ways. The Norwegians did, the Irish did, uh, many cultures did. And I was able to find a lot of women and their children because they would give their children their sons their middle their for their middle name we give them their surname oh, okay. so i found a lot of scots because the girls even though they married somebody else and they ended up with the name of jones or welch or you know mcdonald or something else their sons had scott in their name yeah and then going back to you can do that through the royalty but besides once you have the King Henry's or the King Philip or somebody in your family, you can just pull a book off his shelf. Yeah. And yeah. then you've got all the names in the book off and, or wills have the names. And, and one of the things I learned in doing genealogy is that when you get on a census record, you read every record that year, the minute census records were widely available. I just read every single one of them for every place I ran into because people didn't settle independently. The only ones who settled independently often were orphaned girls who were sent here during a famine and they got jobs with rich people or some important politician or wealthy doctors. And then they their names changed and they were hard to find. Yes. Um, but everybody else, I actually made a bind or family trees for every Quigley name that I ran into in America. Wow. And got them all in the same place. And fortunately, they settled together or not too far apart. Yeah. So your family, there are going to be other Joneses in that uh, census record, even though it's not the same town, even if it's the same county or you get out, you can Google now. Yeah. You can get a bird's eye view. Yeah. You can put in a place, a township or something, a post office. Yeah. And you can see that a Jones lived here, a Jones lived there, a Jones lived there. And they all had, coincidentally, uh, the same older father who'd come to live with them, who used to be married to somebody else named Ellen. And then they had an Ellen in their family. And you, you can start accumulating but you got to read every census record every census record that takes so long to do i started tackling the genealogy pool just because it was something i was interested in 
but oh my gosh, I was overwhelmed by the amount of hours. It yeah. was yeah, yeah. And I mean, I you got spend days. I, could do it. I would spend days. My husband got sick. Yeah. Really sick. He had heart attacks. He had strokes. He had oh, COPD. He ended up dying of dementia from all of the oxygen deprivation that he had from strokes and heart attacks. And sure. and he had a procedure that gave him a global stroke. But anyway, I was with him all the time. And as it got dementia, I had to be with him. But he was a really sweet, docile person. Yeah. And so I didn't have to chase him around the neighborhood like some yeah. people do or yeah. go looking in the grocery store or whatever. Right. It was just easy. Uh except at night he would pack his suitcase to go places that oh. didn't exist or he wanted me to get the kids out of the bathroom. The kids were already 50 years old. You know, he thought they were playing in the bathroom. Oh my goodness. Anyway, but he was easy. So I sat for hundreds of hours while he was sick yeah doing research yeah that's what helped me in part to get the story written dang that is incredible so now is this the only book you have or do you have yeah other i have you? two other books that i've i have had the feeling that barnes and noble and excuse me for saying this barnes and noble and amazon and those are places authors send books to die and that's become a reality. I know I've sold books at Barnes and Noble. I've sat there and signed them and have, you know, never gotten any royalties. So things are really a mess, I think, in the publishing. So I'm going to publish the next two. They're histories uh, around individuals in the 1600s in the Confederate Wars. Yeah. 11 and nine year wars and okay. that 1641 rebellion that I should have loved your work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah, the the Barnes and Noble and Amazon. That's what. Well, there's so many. The problem I think there's a, just so many books to choose from. Oh, it's so hard. Millions. It's it. Yeah, there's millions, 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 and you really have to do a lot to uh, make a name for yourself, especially if you're new into this whole industry, right? Right. I've seen I've seen people who you know. I was just talking about this the other day. Uh, celebrities, for instance, they write a book, they do podcasts, they do shows. Well, they skyrocket to the top of the charts because, well, they already have a familiar face. People yeah. recognize them from whatever. And they go, okay, cool. I'm now, oh, I yeah. want to check them out because they, you know, I I resonated with them to some degree. Us, other people who are not celebrities who are writing books and doing things, we still have very important things to say, interesting stories, compelling stories, but right. they're just not out there. So for us, us peoples who are down here, the common folk, if you will, um, getting out in front of people in town like you're doing, um, yeah. doing little shows like this that I'm doing, trying to involve as many people as possible. Right. Seems to be the way you kind of break out of that. It takes so long. And it, well, it, yeah, it, it is worth, I think it's worth doing it that way, but it's so hard. You're right to, the to first break out. Publisher, I first published this in 2020 and they overpriced the publisher. I thought I had Penguin. And I thought Penguin was great. All yeah. of our textbooks, our history books, yeah. there's a great deal of credibility with yeah. Penguin. You know, all the classics come out of Penguin. And I thought, wow, I had a lady who was interested from Penguin. Mm -hmm. So, and she very, you know, indicated to me that they wanted to support my book. And she would call me and see how I'm doing. Am I done yet? And how far? And blah, 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 blah. So I sent her finally the manuscript. And I didn't hear back and I called and found out that that story had been sold to an independent publishing company called iUniverse. And then I hear I spent my whole life coming, understanding, studying, researching, and then sitting down and writing the book in 2012, starting in 2012. Right. And here I am in 2020, and it's not where I thought it was. Yeah. And so, and they overpriced it. They they had it priced twenty nine dollars. Who's first book? Look at me, almost eighty years old is twenty nine dollars. Right. I mean, only Christ could get that kind of money, or or Patterson or somebody. Anyway, um, so I went to a local guy and I said, "Here, I'm gonna you print it." I'll rewrite write it, redo the cover, whatever. You print it. He said, oh, I am a publisher. So I'll, I said, okay, 
well, then you do it. Well, then the book, the format got destroyed because it went from one format to another. All the italics were gone. All of the, they did a spell check. Mm -hmm. And I write in Irish accent. So it did a spell check and took out every Irish dialogue that I had. So I virtually started from scratch to get it redone for the publisher. Anyway, so now I'm republishing, self-publishing my other two books. Yeah, I think the self-publishing, honestly, is the way to go. If you can get it traditionally published, great. But there's like 1% of 1% that are submitted get published. And then marketing is a nightmare. They market by two, three months. And then you're old news. Now you have to take on the marketing. So it's like, and you take on most of the risk there. And with, we're and, and, and the first the time you write a book and yeah. all these people, if it gets out at all, you start getting deluged by phone calls. Yeah. I just got deluged by strangers saying, you have a wonderful book and we can do this and we can do that. And they just want your money. Yeah, that's it. And they say, so oh, scammers. we're going to list your book here. Or you're going to go to Amazon and you're going to, and all it is, is the title, the ISBN number, uh, yeah, it, it. it goes onto a list. Yeah, that's it. It's just a list. Yep. I had a, a, another author on here who was telling me a story about how he had <clears throat> his hardcover done and he was thrilled about the hardcover. But the problem is he goes, the money's in the paperback, the dollars in the paperback. Paperback is going to sell better because no one's going to really buy a $30 book. Unless they really like you or the stories. Okay. That's just right. how it goes. They're going to buy it's an important piece of history. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah, you know. So, and he was like, so he was approached by, a, um, approached by a publisher and he was saying, Hey, we're going to make you your paperback. And he's like, Oh, sweet. Thank you. Well, over six months or however long they didn't really deliver. And it was, they, they tried to, and it, was, it just was a mess. And then he realized I can do my own paperback. So he said, screw this. And he went on his own. And he made his own paperback. He's like, you can't do anything I can't do for myself. There's yeah. some, you can farm out so many different versions of your story. As long as you go to those experts, because that's what I'll do. I go to my cover person who does my layout. They're marvelous. I pay for that service. Cool. And then I go to, I have an editor who is marvelous. I pay for that service when on my terms, I put, yes, so you put right. the money, you invest the money in it, but you also get every ounce back to do whatever you want to do with the funds you earn and you have complete control, which as mm-hmm. someone like, like yourself, who's been on this story since you were how old, you know, researching it forever. And I mean, that's a huge part of you. So it's a lot of comfort there too, security. So it, well, see that so I uh, let this guy be my publisher because I, you know, I wanted to end up with a book yeah. and I wasn't sure what all those steps were right. are to do that. Now exactly. I learned what the steps are, but I'm having glitches with my InDesign <laughs> and it won't save in any other format. And I need to have a barcode made for my book, but they can't, I can't put my book cover online in JPEG because InDesign won't let me save. So I've got some, I mean, that's the problem with doing it yourself, unless you're a computer engineer and I can figure out where the corruption is in my file. I don't well, know well, why right. do what it's supposed to do. Well, right. Because I, I looked at it like this. I mean, I, as writers, as authors, we are good at storytelling. And some of us are good at other things too. Like I've got friends I, who yeah. are really good at doing uh, layouts. They're actually really good at layouts, but cover design, not so much. Uh, marketing, that's hard. Editing, they can't edit by themselves. They need more bodies. So to me, when you are working on a book, getting that done, you need experts in those fields because you can't do everything. We can't do everything. You can dabble. You can be a jack of all trades, but you're not going to be an expert in everything. You might be an expert at one of those 10 things you dabble in, but you're not going to be an expert in everything. It's just not, it's just not feasible. So, I mean, it, it makes sense to hire out as you go to hopefully make a good product at a good price. So people will be interested when they see you and they go, oh, this is kind of cool. And they buy it and they support you. That's the hope, at least. That's right. the hope. Yeah. But it's a, we could go on and on about that all day. <laughs> yeah, we could. So you also, um, in earlier life, you were a teacher, too. 
Yes. Yeah. My father was a teacher. My mother was a teacher. My brothers were teachers. My husband was a teacher. Oh my uh, God. My son <laughs> is a, he's actually the equivalent. I, he's called a school director, but he actually is in charge of 17 schools in a large school district. Only 17, huh? <laughs> That's right. a lot of work. It used That's to a lot be fewer. And I get oh so, he was still got up at four thirty in the morning all in the school district. You know, after COVID, they've invested so much money in technology and trying to take care of everybody's child and give every kid a computer that they and then the the revenues went down. So the school districts are all in the hole, you yeah. know, at this at this point. So they in his district they had to, they fired people and then rehired them. And so now he went from only 10 schools to 17 schools. I mean, he has to hire the principals. When a kid brings a gun to school, you know, he has to make sure that the school follows the protocol and he has yeah. to be on top of whatever's going on. Yeah, it's a lot of work. And, yeah, that's a million things that they, they my daughter-in-law has a school principal and they they leave at 4 30 in the morning and they get home at 10 you Ugh. know it's, it's oh it's a horrible job and of course the emails are pouring in while they're like i'm not coming to school tomorrow we'll call your person don't call me you know? yeah yeah like, there's a there there's the layers of bureaucracy for I that just, reason those, yeah there is there yeah. anyway <laughs> yeah i taught i started in junior high teaching junior high and i was a musician Oh, cool. I didn't want to teach music, but I liked to write music. And I was able to sing that before I had my vocal issues. My vocal cords are paralyzed halfway. The top goes together to phonate, but the bottom of the vocal cords, they just spasm. Oh, no. And so I can't phonate certain sounds and I can't sing at all. Oh, man. So it's just a struggle to talk. Yeah, and as a prior opera singer, a professional opera singer, I mean that. I sang at been... CL Opera Company and other community operas and choirs. Oh, oh. And how long did you do that for? Well, my dad, my mother and father were musicians. My mother was a reading specialist and taught second grade, but she was a church organist for seventy years till she went blind. And my dad did musical theater, but everybody in his family could play an instrument or do something, you know, so they all were, you know, there are some families that are like that where my grandfather's family, they all played fiddles. Mm -hmm. And my mother went to visit my father's family just when they got married. And she said they sat in the house all day and played instruments. They fiddled and banjoed and a bit were Irish, Scots Irish. That's but cool. My grandfather was a judge, but they all, I mean, that's what they did. You know, yeah. like Saturday, it was cold out. And in Minnesota and Colorado and those places, it's cold in winter times. And so why not sit around the stove and fiddle? Just play around. That's cool. And it's, you know, before you really, technology is taken off. You're not having the TV on necessarily. So what are you going to do? You know, kill the time. They read. Yeah. They played games and they yeah. played instruments. Exactly, that's awesome. It's the fire. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a lot of fun. That'll kill. That'll that'll make time go by really fast. Yeah, that'll make time go by really fast. That's super. Anyway, I taught English too. I taught. I've taught just about everything. And my husband and I, he was a scientist, and he started out as a chemist, and then he taught high school chemistry, but he wanted to teach social studies. Oh, okay. So he came. A, he went from um, a lab scientist to a middle school social studies teacher and he was happy with that good good so i i'm there but he we taught on mount rainier for a number of years natural history and we had 30 people following behind us you know or i brought up the rear or why don't we give it down for my husband would say go find a place for us to shelter you know <laughs> so i'd run ahead on the trail and I'll find a place to hide 30 people in a whiteout or something. Anyway, so I mean, I've taught a lot of stuff. We taught yeah. a homeschool science classes in the Peninsula School District for oh, a cool. year. 
and that was kind of interesting. But I, my my favorite job, my main job, was uh, journalism. Oh, okay. My dad was my writing teacher, was my English teacher in high school. He was the football coach, the choral director, and the English teacher. And I had him, I didn't have him for football, my brothers did. But sure. Many I hats you were. Yeah, Renaissance people. How long did you teach English for, or journalism for? Well, journalism I taught from about 1990 until we moved here in 98 okay something like that and i taught in prison uh after i retired but i taught elementary music then i went from my favorite job to the worst job (laughs) i mean the kids are great and it's fun blah 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 but it wasn't my favorite thing for music you have to depend on bake sales because they give you 25 dollars and then say, here's an empty room, develop a music program. So I wrote the curriculum. I climbed over a mountain of discarded books to put together, you know, materials for the children they have in the room. Yeah. And I spent no less than $5,000 a year in my music classroom, a, a bass xylophone. Every child has to participate if you're doing music. They have to have something in their hands. Mm-hmm. to make music and they have to learn how to do it yeah and a single xylophone at that time was twelve hundred dollars and the school what? gave me twenty five dollars how do they expect you to do anything well you tell me well i i can tell you from yeah. experience that it's not going to happen like we so my wife my wife teaches she taught first grade for nine years and she's on her mm-hmm. second year of kindergarten and i am not kidding <clears throat> We we probably spend, I, I don't even know how much we spend, but it's definitely more than you can claim on your taxes. That you right, get that. it is. It, it is. Just with, Lauren, they had them out. Oh, we they, yeah. We were able to get a percentage. And then he said, well, we're not going to let teachers claim any more than, what, $200? Or some reason. He had 250. 250 bucks. Well, I'm spending 5000 Oh, yeah. And, and it's to keep my program going. I had to have, I had a set of recorders that I would wash from one class to the other yeah. well then you couldn't do that anymore because of germs even if i used the cleaner i then i had to buy 125 recorders so my students each child had one. Oh my god who's gonna do that the school district doesn't have money for that stuff people have no idea how expensive children are oh yeah yeah well i mean to teach them is definitely you need to have a budget per child per yes. year what you need yeah. to do they're and not we... even close well, yeah. and it, and what's crazy is like a lot of the the funding, it all depends on how well they perform in the school. So if you have right. higher income families, right, who have more stuff to provide the kids, more resources to provide the kids, they show higher test scores, which means that that school gets more money. But funding, then you have the kids yeah. who aren't exposed to all this extra stuff because they just they don't have the resources to their schools don't get funding. So it's just a continuous cycle and it's ridiculous. So you have like uh, uh, teachers like my wife, who is very dedicated and loves the kids and wants them to have the same experiences and to be exposed to those things. I mean, I can't tell you my time. She's like going, just going to the grocery store. Can you pick up this and this and this for the kids to have a snack? Yeah. Yeah. You provide snacks for the children. You make sure that the kids my mother used to have clean clothes at school for kids who didn't smell good because that, that way too. they wouldn't be teased. Yeah. Oh and my she God. had different size jeans and shirts and, mm-hmm. and she would bring their clothing home and wash it Yeah. and then give them something else to wear and then swap it out again. Oh or, my goodness. You know. Anyway. Yeah. That we'd have, we'd have different like events um, where the fire fire department actually was really cool. They came by and uh, they brought the fire truck and the ambulance and the firefighters had all their gear on and every single fire, every single kid got a winter jacket that year. So, yes. which is pretty cool. My grandson like that. Uh, who worked as a director program facilitator, I don't know what he was called for the YMCA. <laughs> sure. He was one of his one of his inspirations was to make sure that kids in his area of in which was charged all had coats and he 
went around to different manufacturers and talked them into giving him coats so that yeah. every kid that was under his purview, his whatever, I don't know whatever you would call it anyway, his sphere would have a coat because that wasn't really his job. His job was to do programs yeah, uh, for kids to keep them in school and interest them in going to college. Right. But they were coming in without coats. And then, yeah. then the children in their families, the little kids didn't have coats. So he, you know, he just, if you're dedicated to service. Yeah. Well, we had, we had another incident too with, uh, she was hearing about the kids not having books at home and, it right. was like, <clears throat> and it was like, so we had the little paper books that you get for like, yes. lessons, and they're like four lines like and scholastic books. And yeah, they, I'm not even, I don't think they were scholastic. They're just like the paper ones you fold on oh, yes. your own, you staple together on your own. And so we, we, you know, we get those and she'd have those made up, but she's like, one day she goes, she comes to me all serious. I want to buy every kid in my classroom a book, one per month for the whole year. And I'm like, you know, this time we're not exactly rolling in money at this time. I, I'm no. like, uh, I don't think how? so. <laughs> how? And so we looked into it and Scholastic had a deal where you, you know, you get book orders and then you get points and you're able to use those points for books. I said, well, right. that's all school that you yeah. use that for school. And yes, we will put it out to the families too. Because like the the financial burden, there is a financial burden that comes with it. And thankfully, we've been blessed enough that we can actually put Thank towards you. good things for her for her students, which I really I'm I'm grateful that we can do that. But yeah. it was funny because she put that out to the masses that, that goes, hey, like my husband and I are going to buy books for the kids one per month for the whole entire year, September through June. Uh, so give them a little bit of a library at home to practice with, you know, storytelling, to practice with reading. And one dad walked up and handed her a hundred bucks, like use this, all of it. I don't want to see it. Right, and right. I was like that, that actually, and how she found different books, different programs, bundle deals. She was that paid for almost three months worth of books for the kids. I'm like, awesome. You know what? Cool. Let's, right. let's just do that. It's not going to be that much. Yeah. We can People do step up. They do. They do. And, and that's really cool. such a worthy and important thing. It is. It is really. Books at home. Yeah. 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 We have to, it's, it's, it's hard not to overgive sometimes and hard to, you know, some yeah, people we're draw the line. Them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we've, we've gotten pretty good at the balance there. And I was like, just like, yes, we will have to support, but make sure you put it out to other families too, because it's a, we can yeah. do more together than we can. just. I, I have to break, get into it. One of the reasons I like teaching in my journalism, in my English classroom is that I actually had access to materials. Oh. In music, I never had access to materials, had no money. I mean, you're really on your own. And it's so nice to go into a classroom where there is a textbook. There is a curriculum. There are There's a book list for eighth and ninth graders of what they're presenting in their curriculum. Uh, and I liked teaching math also for that yeah, reason that's cool you can, you can pick up a textbook there are tutorial sites for kids there's a lot going on yeah anyway yeah good back stuff to the book. yeah back to the book well anyway so when you finally started writing so you started writing in 2012 you said right um and how long did it take you to finally get that story down for your first draft how long took your first draft to get done well i my first draft doesn't happen like that. I'm not a, I'm not linear necessarily. Right. But I had to start with the the story was so complicated and so big, and it was like a James Michener times four volumes, mm -hmm. and I had to find a way to weave it kind of in strands or threads of idea. The idea of the immigrant and the cultural and the real problems with immigration, what people, all immigrants experience when they come. And everybody comes from somewhere for some reason. War, can't earn a living, a disease, a disaster, a dictator, they're trying to, they're getting shot at by gangs. Everybody comes from somewhere for a reason. And 
those same themes run through every culture and manifest themselves in different ways. So I had that threat of the immigrant. I had this incredible history of the development of America, the building of America. And I realized early on that I didn't know. I knew they were in New York, and then I knew they were in Missouri. So then the questions started coming. How did they get from here to there in reality? So that's her like census records, death records, all that kind of stuff kind of put you in a place. And then you have to look at the, I love the old census records because there's a lot of hate. Mm -hmm. The women's names were never on them. It would be John Jones married. Mm -hmm. Well, who? Female. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And that was, that what was it. Well, who was this woman? Yeah. So then you had to find Ellen's name and at approximately the same age as the husband in a census record. And you say, oh, that was a living girlfriend with his 10 children or his wife, <laughs> which, which do I think it was? You know, anyway, there was that thing of the growth of the western frontier so i had to know what roads there were yeah you know so I, le I learned the history of roads in america and the original roads and when the roads were built and who built the roads and and then i ran into robert scott who was the, which was the name of my sixth great grandfather who lived in west virginia i no 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 he lived in in virginia and he was responsible for orphans and roads. And he was an immigrant. Well, he brought a lot of money with him, I think. Yeah. You know, and he owned a plantation. And with the plantation came the slaves. So a lot of my family were abolitionists. So what did they do? I think they did what they had to do originally and then let them go. And I do know that one of the Scots in Virginia provided got enough money together to send his slaves back if they wanted to go home oh and it's a famous story but he was one of the scots that allowed his slaves to go with it if they didn't want to go back to africa then he gave them a gun clothing mm -hmm. and money like an indentured servant would get yeah. so that they could survive you know they weren't supposed to own guns but i know that he gave them a gun so that they could eat yeah yeah they had to eat right anyway so there is that part of the american story that people aren't necessarily familiar with and the western expansion like some of these census records were taken when there were six states 13 12 18 states and, and sometimes the northwest territory which was michigan along the lakes and are the lakes and didn't belong to America. They took the census in 1792 there just so they'd have an idea how many people lived there because they had no idea. Right. And the same with the South. Um, Spain, everybody, France owned parts of the South. We didn't own the South yet until, yeah. we, until the 1800s. And so, like, people wouldn't even go there unless they already had somebody who was living there. And then they went, and I discovered which was amazing to me that the first Irish actually came here in the pretty early 1600s because they caught rides with the Scottish captains who dumped them on the Carolina coast. Oh. And so some of the first, O'Brien was an original name to a group of um, Irish who yeah. settled on the Carolina coast early, early, early on. So on my website, I have 12 blogs that in which I have that history and that information. And I had to do know everything to do deductive reasoning to <laughs> discover where they were. And I used occupation. My grand uncle, Michael Quigley, my protagonist, antagonist brother was a stonemason okay. trained by... Uh, one of the best masons in Ireland from Tipperary and Father Bernard, who later was Archbishop, uh, was sent by the church to Kansas and he hired 300 Irish families from Connick uh, to come in and build Kansas City because Kansas City was limestone cliffs that came up 
dramatically, precipitously from the Missouri River. So he set these Irishmen into chiseling down the cliffs. They made a brick factory and they cut the better limestone literally with saws out of these cliffs to build churches and schools and hospitals. Wow. Wow. And they were the first ones, always the Irish and the Catholics and Lutherans, I think, built churches. But they always, my family that settled Mary McManus, who was the wife of uh, Joseph Quigley's wife, yeah. her family settled a town called Emerald. And they, they came from Ireland and they were the last Bible merchant family, uh, linen merchant uh, family from Down, County mm -hmm. Down. Okay. And they settled a town called Emerald. But I mean, there were all of this stuff that needed to be in the story. There was the war that needed to be in the story. There was what happened. How did my family, this family get destroyed? So oh I had to organize all of these strands and then take each one in a group. And in order to tell the story that happened before, I let this person in this segment reveal what had happened. So I had a lot of flashbacks. So it oh took me... Goodness. A long time. So I wrote the story of each little tiny thing, put it on a spreadsheet, on a timeline, and then decided how I would start. And I decided to start the story the way I learned it. I learned it by finding what was the destruction of the family. Right. So I said, that's a good way to start this book with a bang, you <laughs> yes. know, you know, it's a totally. disaster. Yeah. So and then flashback interwovenly so hey. i flashed back into the civil war yeah. and from the civil war then i flashed back to the immigration there oh was tough they came on a coffin ship 10 people only two brothers ended up on the frontier so it took me a, a good year year and a half maybe just to get my spreadsheet made and get my story organized oh. and then i could start to write what were the important to summarize in my mind that the purpose of that segment of this story. Jeez, your vision, the big picture vision that you must have had or had to acquire yeah. or build massive, like just how you're describing well, it. Was, like it was actually my, my just, life. Blow my mind there. It's like, holy cow, how do you how do you keep it straight? I know you use Excel or a spreadsheet, but a spreadsheet. I cow. kept it straight on a spreadsheet so and a straight. lot of stickies. Every book I ever read that has used purpose for me is just full of stickies. I gotta remember this. I gotta remember I this. Great. I gotta remember this. Yes. So, anyway. Yeah, I do that. I do that with my manuscripts. And when I was reorganizing, when I was reorganizing my story, because I'll have three main characters and I, I interweave them chronologically. Oh, in yes. The story. Yes. And so I write, of course, one at a time, you know, and then you go through and okay, this person, this person, what happens here? And you literally just interweave them with layer. The, yeah. You layered on, yeah. right? And I have yeah. the different numbers and, and the huge line of sticky notes for the chapters. Because you can remember those when you wrote it, mostly. But yours sounds like a 3D puzzle you're trying to put together. It just... It actually was. And I, I thought of it as a braid of hair with five strands rather than three. <laughs> That's you know, a weird to put it, too. And I was doing a, a braid. Oh, my gosh. Well, kudos to you for getting that organized and done. And holy cow. How big is the book? How many words did it well, end up being? you won't believe me. It was a, it was a thousand pages. Oh, uh, I would believe you. The amount of history, yeah. heck yeah! It was a thousand pages, hundreds of thousands of words, and I got it down to four hundred. And in my last edition, I went down to three hundred, almost four hundred pages. Wow! How do you cut the, How do you cut out stuff? How do you stuff that doesn't move the action forward? Okay. okay. If there's anything that is just interesting and you like it and you think it's an amazing story and People don't know this and they need to learn this. I'm a, I have a teacher gene that says, people need to know this. <laughs> no, they don't. Right. Let them find out about their own family. They yeah, don't right. need to know about what okay. I think is exciting. So it doesn't move the story forward. Okay, it, it drives the action and it has to have an organic shape. This is what drives me crazy about fantasy. 
fantasy writers, excuse me, all no, fantasy fine. writers are wonderful writers, imaginations. I have an imagination too, though, and I'll, but I just use it a little differently. Yeah. But they say this happened, then this happened, and then this girl did this, and then there were all these soldiers, and then the king said, "It's like, where's it? Where's where's the cause? Where's the consequence? Where's the?" So all these disparate pieces actually have to drive the other. Yes. So if I stop and talk about some of the little children that were in Joseph's family's little siblings who settled actually in Pennsylvania, one of whom was killed in a mining accident when he was fairly young. His sister was raped. She had a baby and he took responsibility. His, he was a younger brother who took responsibility for his older sister and her baby. And he became a miner. Mm -hmm. bought a little house and she was a tailor their father was a tailor and she could sew well but one of the mining cars irish were used in the mines to push cars uphill mm -hmm. when they didn't have donkeys and the cars would roll backwards full of coal and smash them he got killed between two coal cars and i found that story in pennsylvania well that's an amazing story about joseph's family but it doesn't need to be in the book because it doesn't deal with what happened to this family. Yeah. So you have to have that at the top of your brain. This is what it's about because you can go down those rabbit holes really easily. You so can. I just went through and just chop. 20 chop. Okay. Yeah. So you could have basically, you could always create another more personalized store, uh, story for those, for those tangents. Yeah, I if have you to. 150 books in there if I wanted to. I oh, yeah. yeah. I have people saying, where is the sequel? What happened to your grandma? Well, that wasn't that story, and I'm more interested in writing a new story. Right. That's that's something interesting, too. I've, I've noticed that. It's like, what's the point of this? And that's where that's where you, that's is where you need, especially, I mean, honestly, it's not just fantasy writers. I think it's a lot of writers, too, just everybody. They need to have someone like that focus. going focus. Yeah. Focus. You know, focus. kind of like the, um, uh, what do you call it? When you go bowling, you put the bouncer, the bumpers up. It's keeping oh, that ball in lane. Yeah. Yeah. I mean? uh, for, for the kids and the adults, although I it's could use it. kind of like people bowling. who say that you're going off the rails. <laughs> yeah. You're going off the rails. Yes. Yes. You're going off the rails. This doesn't have to be there. And I've talked to so many other authors who said I had, I had to cut 30,000 words because I just, went on a tangent to nothing. I made it its own separate thing. I'm like, cool. Because like you said, you want to drive the story. The yeah. Way. And it's so hard not to get distracted. There's so many shiny objects and new stories you want to talk about. It. And especially in history, there's incredible stuff and yeah. terrible stuff that happens. <laughs> so it's easy to get distracted. Yes. And there, were, there was a terrible thing that happened consequently from the, being made orphans from my grandmother's immediate family that it's an incredible story. It's just yeah. one of her brothers. Yeah. You are continuing with the story or do you have more books in the, in the, fire I'm or? going to do this. Okay. <laughs> I am going to, I'm old and this really makes me tired. Next in two weeks, I'm driving to Ellensburg every day to sell a handful of books. And I'm going to hopefully sleep on somebody's couch a couple of nights but I buy off more than I can chew. And then I say, I can do that uh -huh. because that's my personality. I I, I, I can do that. I'm going to set it up. And it, once it's set up, that's what I'm going to do. Is it somebody down in Ellensburg? I used to go to school down well, there. Oh, yeah. It, yeah. Love the campus. The, the Fred Meyer store. Oh, okay. Yeah, cool. I sit there and this is how I promote my books. Could I interest you in a great story? Yeah. Yeah. Did I interest you? <laughs> I don't sell my, I sell them one at a time. Yeah. And one out of 10 people, maybe, or 15. Yeah. And right. I'm doing okay that way. But I have two movie. I had actually 12 production companies who contacted me about my story. Really? Yes. You name it, they contacted me. Netflix, Amazon, Sony. What's his name and what's his name, the actor? And I mean, everybody and Paramount One. I mean, everybody at some point said, we're interested in this book. And so I kind of selected from my own experiences with music production. 
Sony makes great things. They make pretty things, nice things, things you want to look at or listen to. Uh -huh. Their sound production is perfect. And so I said, oh, Sony's great. And then who's rich? Amazon's rich. I mean, Amazon's the world. Google and Amazon, and I mean, they own the world. A couple of them are going to co-produce, they say. And the production is, the deadline is 2025. Whoa. Early 2025 for a 12 part TV series, which is interesting. And then I think my book would sell itself at that point. So it's it's confirmed or it's all just kind of it's it's in the production process. It's in pre-production, yeah. in which of course that means money, 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 money. You yeah. have to get the 190 million or whatever it is, dollars commitment to make this monstrosity. Do we know what the name is, the title is, or no, I yeah. don't know, but I have settled on in my brain the fact that I will, I don't, I'm not gonna have enough money for my property taxes in four years. So, my goal is to find the pot of money at the end of the rainbow that's gonna keep me in my house, sure, sure, because my social security isn't doing it, and yeah. And if certain people get their way, there won't be a social security. And my teacher's retirement is just a pit. Washington State retirement is the worst. Might tell your wife that, and if she doesn't already know it, we already are on top of it. So yeah, I know. <laughs> so my twelve hundred dollars doesn't quite <laughs> pay for two story house, uh, yeah. you know, the view yeah. uh, for the property tax. Anyway. Uh, my book, I'm hoping, will sell itself. And if I get to that point, then I'm not going to worry about selling this book. I'm going to try to sell my other two books that I think are really great. I love the one about the monk. I'm not quite done with it. But... Oh, cool. Cool. Well, we can talk about that later as uh, in a future future interview, I think, right. as well. So where can people get copies of your book? Are they are they online? Do you have a website? Or are they just going to have to find people, you out in town? People say, is it on Amazon? Is it on Barnes and Noble? And I can say, yes, it is. And then I say, but don't buy it there. Yes. I don't care if it gets, I get credibility or greater notoriety or whatever if they buy it there. I also get less, the greater the you know notoriety, the less the money. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. I mean, I don't get a nickel of royalty from those people. So I have a website. It's, I don't, is this backwards? Nope, it works. www.mary Mary e. yeah, Mary e. Jaffe. Jaffe. Dot com. Sweet. And I have my 12 blogs on there and you can buy the book on my website. Okay. Or go to a Fred Meyer near you. Sweet. Yeah, yeah, go to Fred Meyer, check it out. <laughs> I I've, I've gone to Fidge Way and two of them in Kent and I went to oh my goodness. Lake Waste, uh, Lake City. In North Seattle and uh, Maple Valley and wow. Bellevue, Bellevue, and I next week I'm going to be a week after this I'm going to be in Ellensburg, and then I'm going to be in um, I'm going to be in Gig, Gig Harbor. Oh, cool. I kind of didn't sign up for that one yet because I knew that Dale Gardner, who's a writer, and um, several other people who write that you're familiar with in Gig Harbor mm -hmm. have done that store, and they don't seem to do the other ones. It's about Fred Meyer that that you... Uh... It's a man who has a, a contract with Kroger stores oh. in different states. So California, he asked me if I wouldn't mind. He called me up and he said, you're a rock star seller. I'm looking for somebody who can sell a book in California because I like to get a contract started with the Kroger stores there. He said, can you, how far is that for you to drive? <laughs> and you know how the East Coast is sort of scrunched together. They are. I mean, the West Coast is like this and the East Coast is like this. You know, mm -hmm. it's kind of concave. And so you can drive New York, uh, to Boston and oh, yeah. you know, to go to or Connecticut to New York to go to work or New York to Baltimore or Baltimore to Washington, D.C. and into Virginia. And they're just all sort of there's an apex or a, a vortex of <laughs> states that kind of makes it a smaller area. 
It so does. I think people back there. They intersect but, right there. Yeah, that are kind of think the states All and California is like this and Texas is like this. California is huge. So driving from one end, like for Washington to California, I said, that's like you going to Florida for work. Yeah, you know, it's insane. It's, it's, yeah, we yeah. we did a we did a road trip and uh last year, 2022, summer 2022, and it took us, you know, a day, literally eight, 12 hours just to get from one side of Montana to the other. And we didn't even make it all the way through. We got through most of it. You know, it was just it's insane. Yeah. It just, things are so long. And then on the East Coast, we did a trip years ago. This is oh well, god, 15 years ago, and I was shocked because I'm a Washingtonian, so West Coast West Coast guy, yeah. Yeah. and we went from Pennsylvania, <clears throat> close to the Delaware border, and yeah. drove north up, and we're in New York within eh, three-ish hours. I'm like, yeah. we're in Long Island in like three-ish hours. That was with stopping for gas, with stopping for lunch. I'm like, we, we passed through like four or five states. No, right. not really. You know, we've passed through two states, and we're in, what? So it just blew my mind at how close everything was over there. So Yeah, it really is. Anyway. When, after my husband died, I bought a van. Yeah. And I got it. It took everything out, put in insulation, pretty linoleum and kind of girl blamed it and put a bed, a microwave, had two marine batteries under the back, had a, one of those uh, alternator things that allows you, if your battery dies with your car, you can start it with your interior marine batteries. And I drove from here to New York following the trail of all these people and went to all the cemeteries and I spent the whole summer and it, you know, it took me several days to get into Iowa, Missouri area. And then no time at all to get across Pennsylvania and that Pennsylvania railroad and the Allegheny Portage canal. It took my ancestors in Pennsylvania from 1722 when they moved there it took them over a month to get across pennsylvania and into west virginia and some of the scott girls were schoolmasters back in the late 1700s and that all the girls had education they all worked and they were schoolmasters and the germans didn't even let the girls go to school you know which to me is amazing yeah but anyway uh I made that trip across Pennsylvania in hours, not a month. Yeah, uh, I know. Isn't that crazy? Difference yeah, on that turnpike. And there I was, Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Yeah, you can anyway. just go anywhere now. with As long as you got a car and some gas, you can go far in a very short amount of time compared to our ancestors. Except I was getting 11 miles a gallon. <laughs> I gas- didn't say it's going to be cheap, but ah! you, know, you can get there <laughs> fast. I had to sell it. <laughs> Anyway, that's hilarious. Well, Mary, this has been really great. I'm so glad we could connect and talk about the genealogy in your book and some exciting news about, you know, production. That's really cool. I'm, I'm going to look out for that and I'll probably well, hit you up with me. Knock you know, on wood. Yeah, sometimes, knock, yeah, knock those things everywhere. don't get realized always. That's oh, yeah. Dream. Well, fingers crossing for you, right. you know, and uh, well, keep me informed because I'd love to have you on if, if more development yeah. comes up. I yeah. would love to talk with you again. That'd be really cool to just catch up sure. on that. Yeah. So, so guys, please, please, please go get her book. Check her out. Go find a Fred Meyer near you. And she might be there <laughs> selling some books or go to Mary E. Jaffe, J-A-F-F-E dot com to go One buy e. support her. What's that? One E. One J-A-F-F-E. 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 Mary E. Right. Jaffe. Yeah. Okay, dot com. Just making sure I got that right. To go buy her books from her directly, because if you support the authors on their sites directly, they get all the proceeds, and that can go towards reinvesting into their stories, right. um, other you know organizations they work with. You get the picture. But uh, yeah, Mary, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate. But thank it. you for inviting me, and Heck thank yeah. you. Your Anna worked out okay. okay. Yeah, I will see it. <laughs> I I will show her. I will send her the links when it comes out, and I'm sure she'll be <laughs> thrilled because she was so happy to to have someone to connect with me. I was like, heck yeah, just more send more people if you find them. So right, I mean, right. it's good stuff. I love I love connecting with people and chatting. It's just it's just a good 
I got my grandmother said I always had the gift of gab. So, you know what? Why not right. use it for use it for good? Right. <laughs> use okay. it for good. Thank you so much. Yes. All right, guys. I hope you have a great rest of your day. And as always, stay mighty and keep reading. Are you an author? Do you know someone who is? If so, then message me, Ryan Oliver, at ryanmoliver.com to set up a free appointment to discuss being showcased on the Mighty Books Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to subscribe to the Mighty Books YouTube channel and share the link to this and more episodes with your friends and family. Thanks for listening. So long for now. Stay mighty and keep reading. <laughs>